A few moons ago, the calendar of the planet Earth changed from 1999 to the year 2000. Although separated by imaginary lines, countries of all religion and race celebrated this wonderful epoch. Spiritually and emotionally, they all celebrated with music. The universal language. Music today should never be unappreciated, misunderstood, or underestimated. It has been so important to us since the beginning of time. Music has hidden power, a magic to invoke emotions, a mystery, for we have yet to understand its multidimensional capacity. Music can be complex and beautiful. Music is an avenue to exploring our imaginations. Sound is a force that literally binds the universe together. All of space and matter are made up of tiny vibrations. In the smallest particle of an atom, there is an even smaller vibrating string, vibrating at incomprehensible speeds and tuned to specific notes, creating light and sound shadows that make up the appearance of our world and of the planets and stars. Music contains a magnetic force that compels us. Recent testing in public school proves the fact that kids who learn music show higher test scores in mathematics and other subjects. Throughout history, harmony and song have been a vehicle for people who have changed the world and uplifted us to higher consciousness. From Pythagoras to Mozart to the Beatles. But what if we take this knowledge farther and examine many uses of music, mathematics, music theory and its connection with color, healing, pyramids, and astronomy. Quadrivium. The word quadrivium means crossroads with a combined knowledge of four paths. Geometry, arithmetic, music, and astronomy. Geometry. Dimensional. Number in space. Arithmetic. Abstract. Rhythm. Number in itself. Music. Harmonic expressing relationships of pitch and time. Astronomy, cosmological number, expressing relationships between time and space. The true understanding of quadrivium has been lost in time. Until now. Coming up, we will be studying the harmony of all four of these usually unrelated subjects along with many other fascinating brand new discoveries in physics, archaeocryptography, coloring music, spirituality, and gematrium. You have the same root in fifth, lower the third, get minor. So this is just to show that thirds are very important in music theory. They're what create the major minor chord. A minor key invokes sort of a sad emotion. You can definitely feel and hear that. Whereas major is happy. I started looking at music as being round, and I 
saw it as being a cycle of, of notes repeating, so I thought of a mathematical sequence. Any major or minor scale is a seven-pointed star. This interval was outlawed, but uh, that's what this is what it sounds like. Now, I, do, I call it the pyramid chord. But the notes that are common, and when you connect the lines, create this shape. When I drew lines of all major thirds, so I went A, and what's the major third of A is C sharp, and the major third of C sharp is F. Major third of F is A. So I just connected the lines here, and here we have the shape of the triangle in the circle. E to G is a minor third. G to A sharp is a minor third. A sharp to C sharp is a minor third. From C sharp to E is a minor third. Creates a square, and again, you can go uh, put it at, at any point on here, even with those fill-in notes, anywhere, and it's always going to be a square. This is what I was trying to describe in the Geo Music video part one. Now in part two, we can see how this works. It doesn't matter which note or note you start on, the shape remains the same in any key. The formula creates many interesting sacred geometry symbols, but there's a lot more to it. The intervals and the frequency and numbers of music and music theory are the same numbers found over and over at pyramids and sacred sites. And since the universe is made of vibrations, the ancient pyramid builders are sending an extremely complicated musical message that describes the inner workings of the universe itself. The code is a grid system of pyramids and sacred sites. Here is a rare photo of Carl Monk. Retired Air Force engineer Carl Monk is the man that discovered the code. The code proves that some unknown group of people, or possibly aliens from another world, mapped the entire planet Earth and placed markers pyramids, stone circles, and earth mounds on certain energy spots in the world. The code grid system should not be confused with the earth power grid advanced by Russian scientists and now being studied by Bruce Cathy, Beth Higgins, and others. The code's exquisite math consists of thousands of equations. It proves a mathematical link hundreds of pyramids. When you take the longitude and latitude of a pyramid and multiply and divide the numbers, the end result is a key number, such as 144, 288, 360, and on and on. These key numbers are found redundantly at all sites, in the location and in the construction itself of the monument. Example, the latitude of Stonehenge equals 21600. Stonehenge has 60 original stones multiplied by 360, a circle, equals 21600. The same number as its latitude, its location, the diameter of the moon is 2160 miles. One astronomical age is 2160 years. The number 2160 is also found in hundreds of sacred sites. There are thousands of these equations. More to come later in this video.
One of the most interesting aspects of sacred sites is their correlation to astronomy. All sacred sites worldwide seem to have some sort of astronomical application, but full understanding of the purpose is still unknown. For instance, the pyramid complex at Giza seems to mimic the stars in Orion's belt. Stonehenge can predict lunar eclipses. Chaco Canyon, New Mexico contains the well-known spiral petroglyphs, which mark the cycles of both sun and moon. Sandstone slabs cast shadows of the late morning and midday sun to indicate both solstices and equinoxes. The Anasazi Indians of Chaco constructed a spiral rock carving. The spiral has 19 rings, marking a 19-year lunar cycle. Everything at Chaco Canyon is shrouded in mystery. Virtually nothing is known about the Anasazi Indians, except for they built the most sophisticated astronomical device of ancient days, then disappeared without a trace. Thousands of people completely vanished, just like the people of Easter Island in another part of the world. Were these people dimensional space travelers? leaving behind their knowledge of the stars. Countless sacred sites mark the time of equinox and solstice. The Kukla Khan Pyramid, once a year at the time of the spring equinox, shows an amazing phenomenon of light and shadow. On March 21st, we can see the image of a glowing snake, Quetzalcoatl. The actual name, Quetzalcoatl, converted to number, equals 153. You are about to witness extremely rare footage of an archaeoastronomy site here in Southern California. Hidden from the public and on property owned by NASA, I was able to videotape this special event. <sighs> Still quite a ways to go. That's the peak. Sitting on top of one of the most sacred sites of the West Coast, nicknamed Castle Peak because of its castle shape, this was the winter solstice meeting place for thousands of years. Tribes from hundreds of miles away in each direction all met here once a year in December. This was once the home of the Tongva Indians and the village of Hunwan. In a secret location near here, they built California's analog to Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, a sophisticated archaeoastronomy device.
a small Chumash Indian cave decorated with a depiction of the universe. During the time of the winter solstice, a light dagger appears on a series of concentric circles. On that exact day of the solstice, the light dagger reaches the center circle. This was filmed a few days before the solstice. When that first spire of light hit the circles, it had a profound effect on me. Everything around me seemed to turn into a dream. I felt like I just received a battery charge of some kind of foreign energy. Because I asked strange questions, I was banned from the site, which was already a secret location and extremely hard to get anywhere near there. What I want to know is, why did the natives need such an accurate astronomical device? Some say they needed to know the time of year in which to plant crops. That answer is unacceptable because the Chumash Indians were hunter-gatherers. They did not plant crops. Also, I would like to know why does NASA own this property hidden in the mountains? And why is it such a big secret? The revolution period of Mars divided by the revolution period of Earth equals an interval in music called a major seventh. It is amazing to me that when dividing these two planets' diameters, I also got the same interval. makes sense, and it seems logical. The universe is made of the same vibrations it harmonically displays. The harmonics of our solar system reflect the cyclical nature of vibration in atoms, and music plays a leading role. International standard of tuning is 440 hertz equals the note A. Set in stone by Johann Sebastian Bach. What happens though if we follow the ancients' teachings and retune the entire scale to 432? Four hundred and thirty-two. Here are my reasons to change the standard of tuning from 440 to 432. It will harmonically align the scale to astronomical time counts. 432 times 60 equals 25,920. The amount of years of the great cycle of the precession of equinoxes. The original Stradivarius violin was designed to be tuned to 432. It is the most precise instrument ever constructed by humans. 432 is found in countless ancient sacred sites, along with such key locations as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. 432 is also found at the largest Buddhist temple in the world. At the Boro Badur, the amount of statues at the Temple of Countless Buddhas is 432. Over 2,000 signatures on a petition to the Italian government want to change the standard to 432. Due to the registers ripping many opera singers' voices in 440. In 
fell on deaf ears. But most important of all is when the correction is made to 432, the other notes of the entire octave display a multitude of Gematrian ancient sacred numbers that are astoundingly relative to astronomy, sacred geometry, the Bible, and exact longitude and latitudes of hundreds of pyramids and other sacred sites. Jimmy. Um, I've been playing instruments since I was five years old. I taught music and music theory for a few years. Um, I play now professionally in the Los Angeles area doing soundtracks um, and uh, live shows with many different bands. I've played with Chuck Berry. I played with Chuck Berry when I was 16 years old and I've played with members of Steely Dan and some of the older bands uh, like the Coasters and the Drifters. I wrote and sold a book called Geo Music about geometry and music. And I sell my CDs on the internet of my own original music. Uh, my favorite thing to do is to write songs. Um, so I'm more so a, a composer than anything else. interested in esotericism when I was around nine and I read a lot of books about dreaming, the art of dreaming, and it was a lucid dream that led me to this area of research of geometry and music, um, and it, the lucid dream led me to Carl Monk and the pyramids and many things, and I was never uh, into math before this happened. Um, I think I used to think math was boring, uh, and I hated math, uh, so I'm not a mathematician. Um, I think music should be fun. talking about 432, retuning the scale to 432. What happens when you retune the scale to 432? The other notes become significant numbers. Uh, we went over the number 432 already, but what about all of the other notes? There are 12 notes, and I'm going to cover six of them right now. <laughs> This is E flat tuned into a 432 tuning. When you retune a piano or a synthesizer to 432, all the other notes become retuned also to different notes, to different frequencies and specific numbers. <laughs> E flat becomes a 153. 
the actual frequency is 153 cycles per second. 153 is the length of the Grand Gallery in the Great Pyramid, the passageway to the acoustical chamber. And 153 will be covered later in this. Now here's the note G sharp retuned to 432 tuning. Sharp. I'm going to get my visual aids. Becomes this number. And what is this number? 101.93. number is the exact difference between the two pyramids, the Great Pyramid and the Kefren Pyramid. The Kefren Pyramid is in the middle and the Great Pyramid is here. If you divide the height, these two heights in feet, if you divide them, if you divide the height of the Great Pyramid by the height of the Kefren Pyramid, you get that exact number. What is it also is exactly one-third of the circumference of Stonehenge. Coincidence? An astounding coincidence. The note E, when retuned to 432. We play it up here. The note E becomes the frequency 25,920, which is astronomical. It's an astronomical count. It's the amount of years in the precession of equinoxes. But what is it also? It also happens to be the speed of sound in stone. This octave. One, two, nine, six, oh. Here is a D. The note D becomes the number 144 when retuning to 432. This becomes 144. 144 is sort of the king of all geometry numbers. It's found in a lot of places. It's found at the Bent Pyramid in Egypt. Um, it's in the Bible. Here is A sharp. becomes the radian. It's a mathematical constant. The radian is found in, in the code over and over again. It's sort of a tool to get to the next place, to the next location. But when you retune to 432, the note A sharp, which is also called B flat, becomes this number. Here is B. Note B 
becomes the exact height of the Great Pyramid with the capstone. Here's the note B. coming over to play a live song tuned to 432. We're doing it just for this video. Uh, it's been three or four years since the Geo Music Part 1, and uh, there will be more versions of this, because there's so many things to cover. Um, we will be performing uh, one of my own compositions called The Afterlife. Listen closely and see if you can hear the difference between 440 tuning and 432 tuning. I gotta go right now, I gotta go get set up. We are now tuned to 432.
Throughout history, many prominent people have experimented with a possible connection between color harmony and sound harmony. Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, Sir Isaac Newton. Unfortunately, most of them adopted an arbitrary color scale. Even in our own century, volumes have been written with no conclusive answers. Recently, I devised a formula that produces the correct results. Velocity divided by wavelength equals frequency. Color is measured with a spectrophotometer, and the answers are given in terms of wavelength. Frequency is measured in hertz, or cycles per second. Logic dictates that because of such a huge variance in these two spectrums, that it is illogical to believe that each note will result in a different color. More so would be an idea of a bleed over. The spectrum of color is much higher and covers more ground, so to speak, because of a simple fact. The higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. It stands to reason that a lower light frequency, red, will contain a larger wavelength. Thus, a pinpointed frequency will live under a blanket of color. In other words, the color purple will cover all of the frequencies surrounding the note A. To extract the proper color, or colors, for any musical note, all that is needed is the speed of light and the frequency of any chosen note. With frequency, we can properly find the color for any note. Considering we end up with frequencies so high our ears can't make sense of it, we must apply the law of octaves in sympathetic vibratory physics. An octave above any note is found by multiplying the frequency by two. Working backwards, we can result in the correct corresponding color to audible musical notes. Red and violet are at either ends of the spectrum, just like bookends, just like octaves. Infrared becomes the note B, and ultraviolet becomes the note A sharp. From B up to A sharp is an entire octave, including all 12 notes. The spectrum of red covers more notes and a larger space than the other colors because it is a slower frequency. The frequency of ultraviolet, 466560, divided by 216, equals 2160. How can this be? Ultraviolet divided by 108 is 432, 0.